Hi, my name is Kanal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally, who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. This morning from Singapore, we have a very special guest from 1982 Ventures, Scott Krivokovic. Scott, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me on, Kanal. And uh, how are things with you on your end? Uh, things are things are pretty good. I'm in uh, safe and uh, warm Singapore, so I think uh, given the given the circumstances globally, um, I really couldn't ask to be in a better place. Certainly, around the region here, um, Singapore is is doing a lot better and and um, much better equipped. Um, with its, you know, hospitals and infrastructure and all that to to sort of deal with um, this problem. So uh, d- doing quite well. Uh, how, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm doing very well, Scott. Thank you for asking. Um, and uh, a warm welcome to you uh, for joining us on Geeks of the Valley. It's a, it's a pleasure to be having you here. Yeah, likewise. Um, to to kind of get into our first question here. Uh, tell us about yourself and your background and how it kind of led up to the path of, of being a VC. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think what, like probably a lot of folks in uh, my generation and a bit older, you kind of land into VC, not necessarily in a, in a straight path, um, which may be disheartening uh, for, for to hear. Um, I, I think there's probably more direct routes to get into it Um now, if you're if you're a young person really starting out and that's your dream. But um, for me, the, the road was a little bit more winding. I grew up in uh, Southern California, which is not a hub for VCs or it's becoming now. Actually, there's a lot of uh, there's a the real startup community there and, and even venture funds based there. But um, when I was growing up, it was kind of in the shadow of media. Um, th- there was a lot of innovation and a lot of uh high high tech things going on, but it was done by large defense contractors. So you had Hughes Aircraft, Lockheed Martin, um, all of these sort of really cutting edge stuff, but it, it wasn't the out in the open uh, stuff that we see as, as consumers and users every day. Um, and, and I guess that was just a time of the era. But for me, I, um, I, I, I knew I wanted to work in sort of business, whatever that meant. <laughs> and uh, I certainly like technology. And um, I found my way into New York, uh, moving to New York to, to finish university there. And um, at the time, finance was all the rage. Everybody wanted to be uh, working in finance and, and working, uh, you know, at a bank or, or something like that. And that was also quite appealing to me. Um, I, I've, I'm kind of a finance geek, uh, the people who know me. Um, and uh, I, I started my career out working with credit derivatives at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And, and that was an interesting time. Um, if, you, if you go back to, to that era, this is when there was a real boom in that space. Um, and then, of course, there was a crash and a hangover. And uh, I, because of where, where PwC sits, um, they're, they're an advisory firm and they're not a, uh, a investor or a portfolio manager. And so it was kind of an interesting time for me because we got really busy during the crisis. And that was probably one of the hardest uh, I've worked ever in my life, <laughs> um, overnights, overnighters and all that kind of stuff. And it was really a great, a really great experience. But um, looking forward, what, it, what it, I took from that is I really got to see the inner workings of uh, finance and financial institutions and how um, money and credit move around systems and how sometimes they don't move around. Um, so, so that was a, that was a really great experience. Um, the, the next sort of chapter started because a friend of mine that I had worked with um, and I, after the, the kind of crisis started to level out, um, I think we were a little bit bored. Um, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline leading up to that point. And um, we, I think both of us had always 
had this bit of uh, international, um, international little, uh, I don't know what he call it, an, an urge, as it were. And, and he's actually uh, a, a European guy. So he was already kind of creating his international experience. I actually, uh, I think had barely had a passport, but um, I've been following China story a lot and really just interested in, in, uh, in, in that and in, in just the change that was going on. And um, so him and I, we, we went out to Shanghai and, and started a business and um, we didn't really know what we were going to do. We, we knew that we had some, some skills and we were able to kind of leverage some relationships that we had and uh, we, we built a corporate finance advisory business, um, which was a little bit different than what we were doing. But um, I think it, it, it leveraged what we had and it wasn't a traditional startup. I, I think um, if I would have seen it across my desk now, I, I wouldn't fund it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great business and it, it's a business that still grows today. And again, a lot of lessons learned. And um, I, I really count that time being in China. Uh, I was there for about six, a little more than six years um, just seeing how fast things can change. Um, when I, when I went there, there really wasn't much FinTech to speak of. And, and by the time I left, you had the Alipay's, um, and, and, and 10 cents solutions, just they're, they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous. So having a front row seat to that was just awesome. Um, and it also, it also gave me a chance to kind of, uh, learn how to learn how to, do some deal making. Um, we were supporting clients through M um, and and building their businesses there and, and scaling up very quickly. So, so that was a, just a great experience. Um, the next chapter in my life, if we can compress all these things down to, to a few minutes, um, is, is the chapter here in Singapore and, uh, family really brought me here. I, I, um, I was looking to sort of settle down, um, the, uh, lovely lady who's now my wife uh, was based here. We were doing long distance and we had to decide um, where we were going to really put our feet in the ground and, and uh, start a family. And I think for a lot of reasons, uh, Singapore tended to win out <laughs> over Shanghai, um, despite the, the excitement that Shanghai offers. Um, maybe, maybe excitement is not what you're looking for when you're ready to have some kids, but um so, so that chapter started and, and I was fortunate to uh, land in a job uh, on the investment side. So, so moving over from that client services side to, to investing. And, and that was um, really an exciting thing for me because um, I, I think whenever you're working in client services, you're always thinking, wow, you know, we're doing these amazing deals. It would be great if I you know, wasn't, wasn't getting a, a fee for that if I was actually um, you know, able to participate in this and, and, and be part of the story afterwards um, and really get to realize some of that value. And so in, initially um, we're looking at some, some growth equity and, and I think they had seen my talents there. Um, but we very quickly saw the, the opportunity for investing in early stage for startups. And um, we kind of honed our chops on that. Um, we got some great deals done. And um, that's actually where me and my partner Hurston met. So um, that was a that was a, a, a really great time for me, and um, and really wouldn't be here had it not been for that. So um, flash forward to uh, December, um, my partner Hurston and I have launched our own fund. Um, we're doing still doing the very similar things we're, we're, we're trying to do what we know and uh, we're just excited to really build out a, a franchise business. Wow, Scott, I have to say uh, quite a fascinating background uh, that you have um, all the way from New York to Shanghai to then um, moving to Singapore to raise a family. I do have to agree with you though. I think uh, Singapore is a little more friendlier place when it comes to, to raising a family. Um, from, you know, from what I've noticed <laughs> in regards to uh, how society uh, uh, works over there compared to Shanghai. Um, now you've, you've started this fascinating VC fund, right? You're a founding partner there. Um, what is 1982? Uh, what verticals do you guys focus on? Uh, are you actively investing, raising, and what types of 
check sizes do you write? Sorry for all those questions in one shot, but uh, I hope uh, I hope you can answer. Sure. This. Yeah. 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 So 1982 Ventures is really a, a unique animal in Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's really the first of its kind. We're a, a seed fund um, and we're a, a sector focused fund. So we only focus on fintech um, seed investments in South, Southeast Asia. So um, it's very it's very easy, I think, for for startups to sort of uh, self qualify if <laughs> if we might be a fit for them as a as a partner long term um, if it's those three things and uh, and that's kind of the the thing that we know my partner and I um, that's what we track and it's actually a very large space um, if you think about fintech and and um, it it kind of permeates everything in our lives of course the the two main verticals are um, payments and lending traditionally, but um, it's, it's ever expanding is uh, insurance, um, insure tech. We, we, we look at that um, reg tech and, and really any software that you're selling to a financial institution or um, any companies that are, are taking on the role that uh, that banks and insurance companies used to take on. So um, the, the, the sector look is quite broad but um, still focused. So, so we, we want to stay in our lane. I think if, if you see us do a deal in, um, in, in fashion or, or something like that, uh, you have to be scratching your head. Not, not because those aren't great opportunities, but just um, that's maybe not what, uh, what, what, we're, what we should be doing. <laughs> um, but uh, as, as far as the stage, yeah, we, we are still very young. I, I think uh, I mentioned we, we launched in December um, we've, we've got a little bit of money in our, in our war chest now. Um, we're still continuing to add more. Um, we've just closed our first deal last week. Um, maybe it would be two, two or three, two weeks ago, um, very soon. Um, and that's a, that's a, uh, deal in Indonesia where we're, um, able to put some money with a founder that we've known for quite a while and, and tracking for quite a while. Um, and we're just really excited about that. So, um, are we, are we raising? Yes. Are we, are we deploying? Yes. Um, all of those things, I think we're trying to do, uh, everything at once. And, and really this market, um, right now is, is an interesting one. Um, of course, uh, some adjustments have to be made, but, um, there's really some tremendous opportunities, um, if, if you can have a plan and remain focused. Did, did I get all the questions or did I skip over one? <laughs> uh, you got all of them. There was one in regards to the types of check sizes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got. Great question. Great question. Um, we, we typically write uh, between 100000 to $500,000 checks. Um, that's quite a wide range. Um, I, I don't think it will be that variable in, in reality. We, we want to stay disciplined. Um, I think our standard check size will be about two fifty. dollars but uh, we have some wiggle room. Um, we want to be the first money in to the best to the best companies, um, the first institutional money. So uh, that's that's where we see uh, we're able to drive the most value, and that's where we see that um, the best sort of returns for for our investors are going to be is is to back to back founders early, um, and and then and then push them forward to that next stage. And we, we've seen a gap emerge in the last few years, um, just with the, with the maturity of Singapore and Southeast Asia's VC ecosystem. Um, a lot of the funds here are just growing and, and they're growing on the back of success. So you have to really take your hats off to them. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, liquidity. Um, maybe, maybe this month it won't feel that way, but generally there's a lot of liquidity in the Series A um, space and uh, and and there's there's a bit less in the seed space, especially for fintech, um, where where you have to sometimes really dig into models to to understand them um, and, and and give them some some due time um, compared to some maybe other other verticals which are very uh, tangible and, and you can touch and feel to them. So Scott, uh, diving into you know, you guys, I know, are, are fintech focused, right? And in, in one regard, um, diving into that, the fintech vertical, what type of VC trends are you seeing across uh, Asia and, and maybe uh, the greater globe as well? 
Yeah, so I think globally, what we've seen in the last few years is uh, specialized funds are are becoming more of a trend, um, and and I think this is a model uh, or a, a function of um, funds are are the whole fund ecosystem is just getting a lot more mature. And early on, I think you would see specialized funds um, really just looking at uh, maybe biotech or something that was so specific that um, you really needed, you know, somebody to be a doctor or, or something, uh, just really specific skill sets. But now I think we're starting to see that permeate a, a lot. Um, if you look at what, um, uh, what's happening in the SaaS space, you have funds that are exclusively focused on SaaS business models. You have funds that um, only want to fund um, marketplaces. And so this is this is sort of a, a maturity factor, and um, I think it's for for VCs. It's really about how to find uh, how to find some edge and how to really carve out um, car- carve out space. And all this is enabled, of course, by um, the maturity of the tech scene. So it's it's being matched, and, and I think that's a I think that's a great thing. In Southeast Asia, we're a little bit um, we're not quite there yet. Most funds here are generalist. Um, so we're probably one of the first few that are that are really specialized, but but we're seeing more and more of them, and um, we're seeing some specialist funds also now coming out to Southeast Asia, um, looking looking to see okay we, we know the playbook we know how it looks um, let's let's see if we can get it done uh, and, and be a part of that next wave of, of Southeast Asia. So that that's one of the big trends I think we're seeing. Um, in, South, in, in this region and I think globally, um, and, and we're uh, probably following along or, or, or being a part of that, um, that, that next wave. Then to dive a bit deeper, right? What are some of the um, startup, interesting startup models that you guys are looking at, that you guys are viewing, that you, you see that Southeast Asia is, is abundant in or that should be up and coming? Yeah, I think I think that the um, the great thing is is that the whole the whole market's maturing together, and um, for startups, that's a tremendous opportunity. Um, aside from specific business models, there's some macro trends that are that are really helpful. Um, the the region is is been a source of growth, um, notwithstanding uh, this last two months, um, but demographics and growth are are really positive. Um, there's, there's a few other things that, that really help the ecosystem push forward. So what we see is that, um, especially in fintech, that banks and, and large institutions um, and, and then the startups, there was a bit of skepticism traditionally between those two camps, I think, um, just not sure how to deal with each other. And that's changing very quickly. We're seeing very large uh, FIs now actually keen to partner with, with startups um, and, and learning how to partner with them very productively um, and, and introduce their products. Um, so, so that's, that's really a, a maturity thing that's, that's changing and, and it opens up opportunities for both. I think, I think they need, bo- both camps need each other to be successful. Um, the, the FIs here, um, I'm sorry if I'm using jargon, the, the finance institutions here, they, they really, uh, a lot of them um, are, are not, as digital as they could be or should be, and um, and and there's there's now a push um, to be more competitive. I, th- I think we're seeing and and especially today's situation when uh, branches are closed and offices are closed, um, some of them couldn't can't close because there's just they have to do things on paper, um, <laughs> which is really unfortunate. And so that's I mean that's a that's a that's not an exaggeration, but. It's a it's a little bit of a um, it's 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 something that that's it's always been there, and uh, I think now folks are going to be really keen to start to fix it up. And so, um, what what that translates into is is not just partnerships with startups, but um, integration with startups. And and I think we're going to see more um, solutions starting to be delivered by APIs instead of standalone solutions. Um, as the as the whole system starts to uh, become more digital and and uh, automation and automation starts to um, permeate all the different roles, 
then um, that, that changes the way products are designed. So this is really going to benefit um, SaaS business models, which um, to date haven't been that popular. Um, we see some trends with, with cloud. Cloud is still not here in Southeast Asia. We have it in Singapore, but um, if you go to Indonesia, um, AWS is not quite there yet, um, which, which is difficult for, for a startup. Um, having to put in your own infrastructure or having to uh, work with a local data center, because it's not just the, um, it's the computing power, right? It's, the, it's that service level above that that allows you to really scale quickly and to uh, test and experiment, um, you know, and, and, de and deploy things very, very quickly. Um, so, so these are some really positive trends. If we look at where the region is for fintech, um, you find we're um, a little bit behind or, or, or pretty far behind, um, and not just of uh, sort of developed markets, but also developing markets. And so we can even look at um, areas of, of, of like where Brazil is and say, okay, there's certain things there that have worked and, and they're further along than we are here. And, that, and that's not a negative thing, actually. That's a, that's a huge opportunity uh, for startups because there's just so many problems to solve. Um, if, if you land in, if you, if, you, if you flew from Beijing or Shanghai to Jakarta, um, you, you'd quickly feel the difference um, as far as how, how far FinTech is permeating the economy. When, when, you, when you go to pay for that first taxi ride or you uh, even buy a SIM card, you're not far out of the airport um, to where you realize that um, there's just a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of transformation that that's going to be happening. So, th those are some of the the, the broader themes. Um, it, it would be hard to pinpoint any area of the economy um, where fintech couldn't touch it to make it more interesting. Um, if you look at leading things like e-commerce, I think uh, seventy percent of e-commerce is still cash on delivery. And um, you can say, well, yeah, but if that works, you know, why not? Um, but, but in fact, we know that it causes a lot of problems. It, 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 uh, a lot of deliveries go undelivered because simply the person doesn't have cash at that moment. <laughs> so um, there's, a, there's just a lot of, a lot of um, opportunities everywhere and, and progress to be made. And, and there's going to be solutions that fill the interim. And there's going to be solutions that, that are really uh, able to, to satisfy needs in the, in the long term. And uh, forgive the, the, the expression from probably five years ago, but there, there's definitely going to be a leapfrog effect and there's already be becoming one that we're seeing. So then, you know, Scott, to, to talk about the, the current day economy and how, you know, startups and, you know, venture capital firms are, are working through, you know, current uh, COVID crisis, uh, why is it that uh, later stage funds have stopped investing and, and early stage funds are, are going, uh, are, are feeling like this is to them, not so much a bear market, but, but a bull market for them to, to, to take on and start investing as, as much as possible? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, but I think if we peel into it, it, it does make a lot of sense. Um, I think there's been a, a misconception um, that that later stage or uh, is somehow safer. And in fact, they're just very different strategies. Um, uh, seed investing is a strategy. Um, there's there's a lot of data on it. There's um, what works and what doesn't work. And what doesn't work for a seed stage is to um, invest in two companies and then um, expect them both to be unicorns. So there's there's. Um, where in, or we can call it 10 companies or, or eight companies, um, where in growth equity, that's, that's really your strategy. So there's a few things that, that kind of happen here. I think, I think one of the broad views is that as seed investors, we're investing for the next cycle. Um, we're investing for, um, we, our, our time horizon's a bit different. So we're not trying to flip a company to IPO in the next 12 months. Um, we're really looking at companies that are that are going to grow into the next up cycle. So that's that's really on the on the on the face of it. The first thing, um, if we start to pick into the to the the the, the real nitty gritty, um, seed stage companies are just a lot more flexible. 
Um, usually there's a team of maybe less than 10 people when, when we would invest and how fast they hire people um, is, is quite variable. These are companies that are looking to get their first uh, thousand users or first few thousand users in some cases, or if it's a B2B company, um, they may have one client with a, with a pilot and looking to get um, a few more. So they, they have a lot more flexibility if they don't get that. Um, for sure that decisions are going to be taking longer, but, um, but at least you have that, at least you have those levers, you know, if you have to extend out for a month or two, um, then, you know, you're not in such a bad situation. But I think one of the big things is, is that right now the growth and growth equity investors are going to get, are, they're getting hammered. And so if you have a portfolio of growth companies, um, your portfolio is probably underwater right now. Um, deals that look like they were done are, are not done. And again, part of this is how we, how we do it, do an investment. When you, when you make an investment, um, you look into the future and you, you put a valuation of where you think things are and you discount that back. Um, and in the seed stage, we're looking for uh, returns that are, uh, you can't even calculate the IRR. We're looking for uh, MOC, right? Multiples of capital. Um, to, to get to the, to the next round, we want usually a few multiples on our investment. Um, anywhere, you know, if we're investing at a, a 2 million, um, to get to 10 million, that's, that's a, it's a five X multiple, right? With, with late stage guys, these, uh, these kind of growth equity, they're underwriting to 30% IRR and, um, and, and some cases even less. And that 30% is based on a very rosy, um, bull market case because we've been in a bull market for the last eight to 10 years. So, um, they find themselves underwater and, they don't really have the diversification to, to, to take them out and they don't have the, they, they're not able to capture the upside because their upside will be a two X. And so um, if one of their investments goes to zero, their best investment will just make up kind of back to par. Um, so they're really struggling. And, and I think the other thing that we've seen um, a lot is in the later stage, there's been a lot of crossover investors. Um, these are like strategic investors, um, large corporates and the large corporates are, are reeling right now. They're not going to be making um, a series F investment in uh, some startup. So it can put off its, uh, put off its IPO, which now is very uncertain. So the, um, the, the whole, I think there's a, there's like a, a whip effect where the end kind of, uh, kind of gets whipped up. It actually has a bit more volatility if a, if a seed stage company is worth 2 million or two and a half million um, and the next round is worth four or six, the, the real issue that we see there is how much dilution is the, does the founder taking and is there going to be enough runway and upside for the next round of investors? It's not so much um, an issue of where does the value sit? It's, it's more of a um, how, do we, how do we make sure that the company is funded well and alignment is, is, is existing and, um, and, and the company remains both liquid, but fundable um, in later stage when all this sort of dries up. So on the, on the early stage, there, there is gonna be some pressure. I think just like those strategic investors, we're gonna see a lot of the angels um, pull back. Um, a lot of angels have a, have a day job. Um, they're, they're not full-time angels or uh, they have, maybe diversified investment portfolios. So they've seen their public equities get hit um, and, and they're just a bit more cautious um, or they're not getting that dividend that they were you know, pumping into their startup investments. So there's, there's going to be a bit of a contraction there. And for a seed stage VC like us, that, that means that there's uh, better opportunities available. And um, for our next, for the, the, the cohort that, um, that follows our investments, the series A folks and series B, most of them are also professional investors. They're, um, they're, they're closed end funds. They have to put money to work and they're, they're actually hunting for the best startups as well. Um, even if it seems like, uh, they're not, they're not, um, deploying as quickly. So, um, I think, I think there's, there's even some, some more dynamics there. Um, if you, if you look at some of these companies you might have to do a down round, down rounds are very tough. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of things in their financing and their cap table that they didn't really care about or didn't really notice um, anti dilution or, or, uh, or ratchets, uh, whatever you want to call them um, that come into play where, where the round that they thought they did for uh, 15% dilution, all of a sudden it goes to 25% dilution. And the investors that came in before them are all of a sudden scratching their head thinking, wait a minute, I don't own as much as this company either. Um, so, so you're going to see companies that have done a, a lot of notes or um, done very creative financing or um, pre-IPO, pre-IPO financing and, and these kind of things um, where they tend to get overstructured, um, they're going to be in trouble. So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope that answers your question, but, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough one. And, and, uh, and, and what seemed every, I think everything that seems sort of safe, uh, I mean, nobody could have predicted this, uh, the, this, this sort of thing. And, and I think even uh, folks who were saying, you know, the, the, the market was getting a bit long in the tooth, um, you know, we're, we're due for a correction. Nobody thought it would be a global pandemic that was going to cause this. And I don't think, um, I don't think we quite know how to deal with it yet. Um, True, truly well said, uh, Scott. I can't agree more with, with a lot of the statements you had mentioned. I really like how you methodologically, uh, you know, um, answered this question. Um, that being said, uh, when looking at certain funds, right, like, for example, you know, seed stage, early stage, pre-seed funds, up to later stage funds, how is it that these funds uh, determine their multipliers or um, determine, you know, what rate of return uh you know, they're expected to get over a period of time. Yeah, this is, this is, um, I, I think uh, some of it is dark art. Uh, some of it is thumb in the air. Some of it, I, I think each fund does it differently. Um, and, and then I think despite what the fund does, uh, there's always a market that's telling you what the price is. So um, it's up to you to decide if that makes sense or not. Um, but, but, but typically um, it, it goes down to your, it should go down if you're, if you're, uh, w- want to be uh, professional about it. It really goes down to how you want to construct your portfolio and, um, and how you want to diversify. So seed stage portfolios tend to be um, highly diversified. There's one or two standout investors that have kind of bucked that trend um, and, and done well. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's not the norm. And, and, the, and the better funds... Um, at seed stage and, the, and the, the better performing funds tend to be diversified. And so if, if you look at that, if you look at that fund model, if you've got say 30 investments in a, in a portfolio um, or 40, or if you're 500 startups, you might have a lot more than that. Um, you're, you're looking for investments that uh, I think what Peter Thiel calls a power law where one or two investments will make up for any losses. You expect that, not all of these companies are going to survive and um, everybody's running their own scenarios about how many in a good market or bad market don't survive, but you're looking for um, one or two companies. And it's usually one company surprisingly that returns the whole fund. Um, so seed investors tend to look for uh, big companies with, with big, uh, big TAMs, big, big market potential. Um, and, and that, that becomes, one of their core investment criteria. Um, and, and so if, if you do have some zeros, you know, if, if you're in, like I said, if you're investing in a, in a company and uh, at a 2 million post at a seed round, which if you're in Silicon Valley, you're probably, uh, I don't know, spitting your coffee out right now, but um, the markets in Southeast Asia are, are not quite as big as uh, the market in the U S um, but uh but to go from two to 10, or maybe in Silicon Valley terms, to go from 10 to 100 or, or 20 to 100, uh, um, you know, you're already at a, already at a, at a, at a 5x uh, return. And so that's, that's not where it starts or stops, right? That's just, that's just the next milestone. Um, so I think um, the best seed investors, you're not looking for a base hit. And, and I think the data data stacks up on that. Um, there's been a lot of studies. I think Kaufman's got uh, materials published on that. Um, if you read uh, Peter Thiel's book, or if you read um, uh, the, the, the work that 500 Startups published, and, and most every other fund, I think, in the seed stage has, 
has compiled the data on it. Maybe we're all using the same data. I'm not sure, but, um, but that tends to be how it goes. Um, I think for, for later stage, um, it, it depends on, on, on where you, where you stand and, um, really your cost of capital is, is really your price. If you, if you solve back to everything, um, assuming your cash flows are the same it's it's what am i bidding and what what is my cost of capital and it's it's not that apparent in um in seed investing um nobody nobody takes takes money thinking okay my cost of equity is is uh is twenty thousand percent at the seed stage um because the investment terms are very friendly and it is equity um or it should be equity uh i think there's some other models that, that people try to do but um, there's a kind of a win-win situation. There's a, there's a alignment there. Um, as, as you get further along and as you get to sort of E and F rounds, um, those investors are, are competing a bit differently and the cost of equity is, has been historically cheap in that space. Um, in a lot of cases, you're seeing private equity funds, um, who, who have come back with, I think 30, 30% is what they're underwriting, um, because they're not expecting any 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 companies to fail, um, and they're not really expecting things to go down, right? They're looking at high growth companies, or maybe they're maybe they're underwriting to a higher on it in a in a bull in a sort of bullish case, but um, their cost of equity is is much cheaper um, in general. So th that that just means that assets get bid up, right? If if um, if your denominator uh, uh, gets smaller. Then, then the, the value goes up. So um, that's that's kind of been the been the case in the past. Um, I think I think we also have. Yeah, sure, I answered your question or not? But but the, I guess that's kind of how it works. It's really a matter of your portfolio uh, construction and and what your investors are expecting. So typically, I think if you did the old uh, back of envelope. Um, the stock market returns 12%. I don't know if that's actually true or uh, if it's, if it's been true for a long time, but uh, people want to see uh, private returns uh, to be higher than that because they're seen as uh, less liquid. So um, that's, I think where it all starts. Did, did I explain that? <laughs> we didn't talk, I just talk in circles here, but. <laughs> no, no, Scott, you did, you did a fantastic job of, uh, of detailing that so thank you for that insight um to to wrap up the call here with with one last question um in your journey uh you've had thus far in life right um what is one piece of advice you would give to people who are looking who are who's who's who are aspiring to be venture capitalists or yeah. up-and-coming entrepreneurs um, yeah and, and you, you sent you sent us uh a little bit ahead of time this question which i really appreciate because um I, it's one of those things you, you think you could think on it longer and come up with a better answer. I'm sure as soon as this is published, I'll, I'll think of something better. But um, I think the things that um, I, I constantly look at myself and, um, and, and tr try to improve on and, um, and, and the things that have really helped me along. Um, the first thing is, I think, having a mentor, having multiple mentors. Um, that is probably... Um, the biggest asset you can have and they're, and they don't cost anything. Um, you may have multiple mentors. Maybe you have a mentor, uh, for your family life, you know, um, that, that sort of uncle or, or, or friend of, of your family that, um, just has a real steady head and, and really understands, um, the challenges and it can help you through your personal life and, and your love life and that kind of stuff. And the same for different, for, for parts of your business life. And, and so surround yourself by, by good people um, and, and try to cultivate those because it's not easy to do. And you have to really give a lot um, uh, to those relationships to get the most out of them. It's not, um, it's not going to be the mentor that you get in your first job and they say, okay, this guy is your mentor. And now that's your mentor, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a much more personal relationship, but those can also blossom quite well. Um, the second thing I would say is almost the same thing is just work with the people that you love and love the people you work with. Um, if you don't have that, uh, your life might be pretty miserable. Um, we, we work now, I think 12, 14 hours a day. And, and, um, that's, that's just how everybody's working these days. And, and, uh, and even if it's, 
not if you're not sitting in an office for 14 hours, um, you're, you've got your office in your pocket and you're going to be getting messages from these folks and you're going to be sending messages to them and, and have to navigate a lot of things with them together. So um, try to try to as best you can. It's not always in your control, but, you know, you try to put yourself in those kind of situations that that uh, you you work with um, people you love and. And also just show love to people you work with um, that might, I, I have a daughter now, she's a little more than a year old and it's just amazing. Um, kids, they just don't remember anything. And, uh, and I think sometimes we, we, we don't forget enough um, when we're dealing with people that, that we should just be constantly showing them love. And the last one I think um, is a bit more broad or, or more um, hard nose is when you, when you look at opportunities, look for alignment. Um, I think the, the, the biggest sort of failures or, or when I look back at things, you say, oh, that should have worked out. That was such a no brainer. Why didn't it work out? Um, nine times out of 10 in my life, it seems like it's because there was an alignment or um, some, of the, some of the people involved, some of the key people involved just weren't really bought into it. Um, and, and so having that alignment and making sure everyone's bought into it, that's really what drives things forward. And um, that takes a lot of work too. But that's really what I look for is that people really are, are, are projects that, um, that everybody is fully committed and running in the same direction. So that's, that's my advice. Scott, thank you for that insight. If people wanted to reach out to you to get to learn more about you in 1982 Ventures, what would be the best point of contact? Sure. Well, uh, we'd love for people to reach out. Um, the first part of call is probably our website, 1982.vc, 1982.vc. You can email me directly, scott at 1982.vc um, is a great way. Um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, you, can, you can message me there, though uh, I, I get a lot of stuff there. So sometimes that uh, comes a little bit behind. Um, I think that I think those are probably two of the best ways. Um, but yeah, look look forward to uh, to hearing comments back, uh, people sharing thoughts, um, sharing their projects. Um, we we always say uh, kind of come come to us early. We we like to be early. Um, we want to build relationships. So uh, yeah, definitely reach out to us. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on Geeks of the Valley. Yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a story and, and be a part of uh, Geeks of the Valley.